Hi everyone, welcome back to the third video of the series, Introduction to Environmental and Natural Sciences. My name is Sam, and today we're going to be going over, um, again, a really, really significant topic, and it is going to be on land and water usage. So, let's head on in. Okay, so the first question I have for you is, do you know what the um, three most common crops worldwide are? I'll give you a second to think about it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Awesome job. Honestly, if I'm being quite honest, when I first learned about this, I did not. So the first, um, the three most common crops worldwide are wheat, rice, and corn. Um, yeah, so I just think that's really important because that's, it's probably not something you think about every day. Okay. So we're gonna talk about everyone's favorite topic, um, genetically modified organisms slash crops, and also commonly just known as GMOs. I'm sure that you've seen some packages and labeling that says non-GMO on it, but is that always a good thing? Is that a bad thing? If you have any thoughts before, just comment them down below. Because um, I've had a really, I've become really enlightened this year as I've been educated on these different topics, and the way America markets GMOs is that they're a bad thing, right? Because you see products and then they say non-GMO, but what does that really mean? So, um, from the definition from National Geographic, the definition is of a GMO, an animal, plant, or microbe whose DNA has been altered using genetic engineering techniques. So it's basically saying it's forming an organism or crop that can't naturally occur. So they're combining two genes to make something new that wouldn't, again, naturally occur. So I made a little um, chart of some advantages and disadvantages of GMOs because like most, not problems, this isn't a problem, but like most things they have pros and cons to them. So I'm just going to go over a little bit. So some advantages of GMOs is that they use less fertilizer and water, which is always a great thing because the less fertilizer, the better, because when fertilizer is used, that's an increased amount of chance of getting runoff, which can go into contaminate our water. And, you know, that's not a good thing. And then less water, obviously, you know, we want to use our water well, which I'll talk about later in the, the um, video. But yes, so it utilizes less fertilizer and water. Another huge advantage is that they're more resistant to insects, disease, frost and drought, because that's so important because now they can adapt to be grown in um, new circumstances that um, previously naturally could not occur. So that means we can get more food supplied to those developing countries in the lower socioeconomic status so that we could feed the world more so people aren't starving to death. So, you know, that's always a plus. Um, another advantage is that they, you know, grow faster because of that more they're more resistant and they can grow faster at a faster pace. Again, more abundance of food to feed those developing countries, which is always very important. Um, they can grow in slightly salty soils. And, you know, we haven't talked about soil a lot, but soil is really the foundation of pretty much everything. So it's really good that they can adapt again to those salty soils to be able to grow in those new circumstances because there's something called salinization, which is a term, it's kind of self-explanatory because salinization, it calls, sounds like salt and it just basically means when the soil gets too salty. So if it's slightly salty, these GMOs can um, grow in it, which is so good. And then another final advantage is that it may need less pesticides. Again, that's really good because those pesticides um, are, there's something called the pesticide treadmill and it's basic, basically this positive feedback loop or continuing circle of, you know, you develop pesticides to kill the pest, you know, and then there's always those one or two pests that just don't, they're not affected by it. So then they reproduce and the natural selection occurs. And so, yeah, may need less pesticides. It's always, again, a huge advantage. However, with every advantage comes a disadvantage. So one of the biggest concerns that people have is that there are irreversible and unpredictable genetic and ecological effects. So yes, that is a big concern, but then you also just have to trust science because, you know, we've had extensive research 
um, on a multitude of these subjects. So it's really important to just trust science in that as well, to keep that in mind. Um, so new allergens in food can arise because you know, this is what we're ingesting. And it, um, a common misconception is that GMOs alter your DNA, which it does not. It does not alter your DNA in any form. It just breaks down differently in your stomach, like all foods do. So it's really not that different. Um, but then another thing, it kind of contradicts the um, other advantage that it may use more pesticide because, um, you know, farmers need to use the pesticide to get rid of pests. So that's just going to be there regardless. So it's kind of hard with the pesticide subject. Um, <clears throat> another really bad thing is that it can harm beneficial insects. And, you know, when we think of insects, it's normally like, ew, insects, gross. That's what I think at least. But um, there are, you know, insects are beneficial to our environment. And when they're killing these beneficial insects, you know, that can cause trophic cascade, which is bad. And then, again, <clears throat> another big disadvantage is that it can cause lower genetic diversity, which we talked about in the last video, is really, it's crucial to have genetic diversity. And again, if you're doing something that's not natural, it's obviously going to lose that, which is really bad. And it um, forms a more constrained, like, genetic variation, which is, again, not the best, but we're working with what we've got. So that's just a little bit about GMOs. And obviously there are more pros and cons that you can research on your own, but these are just the ones that I thought of. Okay, so now we're gonna head over and talk about irrigation techniques. So irrigation, if you're not familiar, is just water, giving water to um, these crops. So there's different techniques that farmers use. So the first one and the oldest one is called the furrow irrigation, and it involves cutting furrows between crop rows and filling them with water. So I didn't know what a furrow was when I first learned, so I thought I'd decide to put a picture up, um, and that picture is furrow irrigation. And this is a relatively inexpensive system because, again, it is really old, and it's about, like, 65% effective, so it's pretty. it works pretty well, but... We'll compare them to the rest. So the next one is flood irrigation. Pretty self-explanatory. You flood a crop field, but it is more disrupted to plants than furrow, and it involves flooding an agricultural field with water. And this one is about 80% effective, so it's more effective, but that other 20% is lost to like um, evaporation and runoff. That's where the rest of it goes. So um, the runoff can also lead to something called waterlogging, and that's basically the opposite of salinization, where instead of a buildup of salt, it's a buildup of water. So that's not good either. So then there's spray irrigation, which involves pumping groundwater into spray nozzles, nozzles across an agricultural field. Um, yeah, so it's basically just like a little spray thing. This one's about 75 to 95% effective and efficient. Um, so yeah, this one's pretty good, and it is more expensive again because it's relatively modern, so that's obviously going to be more expensive. Finally, there's drip irrigation. Um, this uses perforated hoses to release small amounts of water to plant roots. Um, this one is the most effective out of all four of these. It's about 95% effective, and that other 5% again is lost due to evaporation and runoff. Um, and this one, you know, because it's the mo more efficient, it's going to be more expensive, right? Um, and it's typically not used often in large oper operations because the drip, it's, you know, very small. So <clears throat> we're not going to want to use that in the larger operations. Okay, now we're going to talk about concentrated animal feedlot organizations, also known as CAFOs. Um, so again, I labeled some pros and cons, but we're going to go over what it is first. So, um, animals are concentrated in an enclosed area and fed grain or fish meal. And I just wanted to note, like, as an environmental, like, um, disclaimer, um, these meals are definitely not as suitable as grass is what they would naturally eat. Um, and they are used as a way to quickly get livestock ready for slaughter because, you know, people eat meat. That's how you get meat. Um, they tend to be really crowded, so that means it's more susceptible to diseases, and it generates a large amount of organic waste. And this organic waste can contaminate the ground and surface water, which is disgusting, but it happens. Um, 
something I wanted to point out is I know they have a lot of CAFOs in Colorado. So if you're from Colorado or you're watching from there, um, just know that you have probably have a lot. And if you ever smell like the CAFOs, they have a really strong smell, you know, because you have a large group of livestock. So yeah. So some pros is less overall land utilization. So that's, again, very, very important because we want to try to conserve the land that we have. And that's part of the land usage is that if we have of a more compact area full of these livestock, then that means we're going to be using less land overall, which is great. And <clears throat> more meat is produced, which, you know, is good for food. Um, higher profits for companies. Um, there's less habitat loss because, again, we're using less land. And it reduces overgrazing and erosion of natural grasslands, which is also fantastic because, um, yeah, if we overgraze, then we're not using the land properly, and that leads to a degraded um, ecosystem, which isn't good. However, there are cons as well. So we have large inputs of grain, water, and fossil fuels. Yeah, we're getting that. It's pretty bad because, as we all know, fossil fuels contribute to global warming and climate change, which is not good. And the large inputs of water, we really want to be careful um, in which we're using our water. Um, concentrated animal waste. So, yeah, their poop builds up and it's pretty gross. And that can, again, lead to more disease um, spreading. And then also the, this is also very bad, the overuse of antibiotics and hormones or steroids is really bad because then that can lead to antibiotic resistance, which means the antibiotics that help us are going to become ineffective. So we have to be really cautious with that as well. Okay, now we're going to talk about sustainable forms of agriculture. So roughly 1 billion people have health problems because they do not get enough to eat. So this typically occurs, you know, in those more developing countries, typically Africa and Asia. And, um, you know, that's malnutrition and starvation. They're not getting the food they need, which is really, that's horrible, right? However, on the contrary, there are 1.6 billion people facing health problems from eating too much. So there's actually more people in the world that are that are literally dying from obesity than malnutrition, which is, I thought that was crazy. So we kind of need to balance that, right? We literally, we need to balance the way we're supplying our food. And so modern industrialized agriculture has a harmful impact on the environment than any other human activity because, you know, we can, they're great, the modern industrial ag agriculture for providing more food, but then think of this, think of what the actual like mechanization does it releases so much more um greenhouse gases into the atmosphere which is very detrimental so again this has its pros and cons so sustainable for farm or forms of agriculture again we need more so i made a little t-chart of like what we need more and less of so we need more polyculture implementation which means again going back to that prefix suffix things poly means like multiple um and polyculture, so more crops, a more diverse array of crops. We need more of that so that we can supply more. And so there's more genetic variation as well. We need more um, organic fertilizers, you know, so we can supply those nutrients back into the soil and um, create that positive feedback loop with these nutrient cycles. More biological pest control. So rather than making new synthetic um, pesticides, we want to use what we've already have, right? So we're using living pest control, which is really important. So we're using what we have. And then integrate, integrated pest management, also known as IPM, is a really like sustainable form of reducing these pests without using pesticides. Um, then we want to use efficient irrigation methods, which I think we're doing a pretty good job of. Um, we want to use perennial crops. So perennial just means like long lasting. We want to have um, crops that are not going to be short term, but rather long term crop rotation. So we reduce soil erosion and, um, you know, just keep switching things up so it doesn't stay in one place. We want to have water efficient crops, you know, the ones that are less susceptible to being taken out by water. Um, again, really conserve the soil that we have, especially the nutrient rich soil. Um, and then maybe the government and we could, this is also why protests are a very good thing. So we can change the, the way the government forms is the subsidies for sustainable farming. So maybe providing 
um, tax reductions for um, doing good sustainable farming and giving people more money because that's what people want, right? Okay, so um, we need less soil erosion. We need less soil salinization. Like I said before, we need less salt buildup in the soils. We need less water pollution. Um, yes, that's pretty self-explanatory. We aquifer depletion. So an aquifer is something that is underground that we cannot see and it basically transfers water. And we, if we deplete that, then we're not going to have something to continue the water to transport. So that's very bad. We need less overgrazing, less overfishing. Um, I know a lot of people for recreational purposes like to go fishing, but you know, just be careful that you're not overfishing. Um, we need definitely need less loss of biodiversity because again, go check out the last video. It's really, really significant in our world. We need less fossil fuel loss. Um, we need less greenhouse gas emissions so that the energy doesn't get trapped in our ozone layer. And then finally, um, we need subsidies for unsustainable farming as well. So maybe we could tax people more, I guess, if they're um, not sustainably farming. So yeah, that's kind of like a government thing, but so that's why we need to keep pushing and lobbying and stuff. Okay, so land management. So how much land do forests cover? roughly 31%, so roughly a third of our planet is filled with forests. So what country do you guys think have the most forests? I'll give you a second to think. I'll give you a hint, there's five. There's five different countries. Good job. Okay, so it's Russia, Brazil, Canada, the United States, and China that have the most forests. So, um, oh, that's just like a picture that I put. There's something that's um, really important, and it's something you're probably not familiar with. It's called the debt for nature swap. And this is more of a, like, um, economic environmental dilemma. So the landowner enters into a conservation contract to restrict development of land for a period of time, typically between a decade and 100 years, in exchange for loan forgiveness. So again, it's basically just saying, oh wait, many countries are doing this with developing nations for forest conservation. So yeah, it's basically, it's one of those subsidies, I guess. It's basically saying, hey, if you conserve the land, then I'm going to give you money. That's basically what it's saying, but it's really important. Okay, so this may look like a lot, but it's really important. So that was more of a land management, but now we're going to shift into more water um, utilization. So this is an analogy that I think is pretty shocking. If all the water in the world could fit into a two liter bottle, all of the fresh water in the world would fit in only a teaspoon. So yeah, that's pretty crazy. Only 0.5% of total fresh water is available for drinking. So that's really small and we really need to conserve. That's why I'm, it's like we have to push for you um, using water appropriately. So as scientists, um, we do case studies, we do, and we analyze data. So there's something in the United States called um, the Ogallala Aquifer. And I don't know if any of you guys live in the, in North, like Western part of the United States, like in any of these states. I live in Arizona, so I'm not directly connected. I'm right here, super close, but yeah. Um, so most of the US crop productions take place in the Great Plains. Um, and the Great Plains is like, like Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, those types of areas. And it's also where my favorite, um, animals live. I love buffaloes and bison. They're my favorite animals. I love the Great Plains. So again, back on track, the Great Plains are areas away from, um, major bodies of water, basically. So the water for irrigation here is typically taken from the Ogallala Aquifer in order to go to the Great Plains. So the Ogallala Aquifer is responsible for um, approximately 30% of irrigated water in the United States. It holds over 978 trillion gallons of fresh water. And just to specify also, fresh water is water that does not contain salt. So it's pure water. Um, so about 14 billion gallons per day is used for agriculture and another 332 million is withdrawn for public use. So yeah, the Ogallala Aquifer is pretty pretty important for our water usage um so it has become severely depleted due to drought and overuse 
So like agriculture, which is why it's so important to have sustainable agriculture. Um, and so um, as a result of this, states are trying to beginning to implement um, methods to reduce this depletion. And I couldn't find any specific data that said exactly what they were doing. So if you found anything, comment below. Um, but yeah, so it's really, really important that we use water appropriately so we can have it in the future. Okay, so I always love tying environmental science to human health and like epidemiology and stuff. So water pathogens, um, inside water there's bacteria and it's typically found in human and animal waste, so fecal matter or your poop basically. Um, and so I work at the Arizona Science Center and every time I go to the bathroom and wash my hands, I see this fact every single time. It's one trillion microbes of just like, just one trillion microbes can live in one gram of feces. And I think that's pretty, that's, that's disgusting. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to keep going now. So potential diseases that can arise from these water pathogens is cholera. And cholera is a disease that um, you get from ingesting feces through like water, contaminated water or food. That's basically how you get it. Typhoid fever, this was way back in the day with Mary Typhoid and how she was a cook, and that's how you can get it, again, from putting it into the food. Hepatitis, um, Giardia, um, E. coli bacteria, and dysentery, which is like um, inflammation in the colon and intestines, which is also very scary. Um, so some indicators of bacteria is the or sorry some indicators of the pathogen the water pathogen is the presence of fecal coliform bacteria and so these bacteria are actually harmless themselves but they indicate the presence of the pathogens um and also a pathogen i'm just going to specify is like bacteria viruses protozoa all that good stuff so the reduction in order to reduce the amount of pathogens we have um, in our like food and water and stuff is to treat sewage disinfect disinfection separate drinking and wastewater which I know kind of sounds if you're in a more if you live in a more developed country um, that doesn't sound like a big deal right because obviously we're not going to drink sewer water because that's just something that's not part of our like daily routine but it's a really big issue in these developing countries which is why we have to help them instead of being so concerned about ourselves we have to help these other countries in order to um sustain their life basically and another tactic is to boil water before drinking because you know as you heat it up the particles move faster so um the bacteria will likely be reduced and then use filters for parasites just to see what's in your food and water i guess and again if you lived in a more developed country these this probably is not a big issue for you but it really is in these developing countries okay so typically i would show um how land and water usage correlates with meteorology which is the study of weather and you can click on this link right here i'm not going to play it exactly it's only like two to three minutes but it's basically this man explaining how um he does an experiment showing the different increase in temperature between land and water and a really important you know of being a scientist is interpreting data and analyzing it so what he does he has a lamp and then underneath that lamp he has like land and then water and then he analyzes with the graph right here and on the data on his little ipad shows the different um uh temperature increases between the land and water. So land, I'll just summarize the results. So land has a low specific heat, um, which means that it basically tolerates heat less. So if you watch this video, you can go see the difference between water heating up and um, land heating up. Okay, so the most important question, why is all of this that I just explained relevant today? Why did I need all of that basis science stuff that I probably wouldn't even think about? So, um, the well-being of ecosystems, which we talked about in two videos ago, heavily rely on appropriate usage of land and water. Because, you know, without land and water, there's no ecosystems. So, it's pretty important. 
and sp this more species will fry will thrive if land is preserved if their habitat is preserved and if more water is readily available that's always it's better to be one step ahead than to be one step behind and with that with more thriving species leads to more biodiversity which again go check out the last video because that's really important see how these all are connected and then finally just to think of because i know some people have a hard time thinking of um species besides humans it really does provide a sustainable future for humans as well because um you know if we don't have water we're gonna die if we don't have land we're gonna die so it really does go back to us in the first place um so with all of this makes a happy earth like i always say um so i know that was a lot and i really appreciate you guys tuning in and listening and again you can definitely go back and like take notes or ask me questions or anything like that um and yeah i really appreciate you guys listening and educating yourselves on these really important modern day topics and i will see you guys in the next video where we talk about global air circulation and climate Bye, you guys.